Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rabbi Jeff Dreyfus. It is such an honor to be here in this hour, on this day, teaching a short story in honor of all of our teacher, Leo Bierman. Leo, Mr. Bierman, he inspired so many of us to deepen our Jewish learning. He embodied so many words of Torah, and especially in this hour, he embodied words that Rabbi Greenstein chanted just a few hours ago. Lo bashamayim he, the Torah says, living a life of holiness, a life of deep Jewish learning, a life of mitzvah. It is not, it is not, uh, in the heavens above so far out of reach. It's not across the sea that we can't reach it, but it is right here, right in front of us. And in this hour every year, Leo Bierman brought the holiness of scripture, of Torah, of our tradition, from the pages of an ancient book to the pages of a modern one. He helped us see holiness in the mundanity of stories about a shtetl in Europe, about the everyday things that we do in our lives, he helped us find holiness and Torah through words about those stories. So before we begin, I wanna read a message from his family, from his sons, from his children. Every year Yom, on Yom Kippur for as long as we can remember, every year it started the same way. We would arrive at Temple with Dad, and he would be worried about whether people would attend his short story class. And every year, he was happily surprised by the turnout. Dad loved to teach, especially literature and short stories. He especially enjoyed challenging those in his class to think about a story in a different way, finding a message that was deeper than the words on the page, looking beyond the obvious, to find something amazing. We are pleased that dad's legacy of teaching short stories on Yom Kippur continues. Doing so honors our father and the notion that we should never stop learning. In that way, it keeps dad's memory alive and relevant. And finally, to those of you who have attended dad's adult learning classes on Yom Kippur and during the year, we say thank you. Please know that the joy and inspiration you received from dad was, return, was returned to him tenfold. And for that, we, his family, are eternally grateful. Thank you to his family. Thank you to Leo. We are honored by your memory. Your memory honors us every day. And it's my honor to teach this story in his memory. So this story, I want to read together, it, or that hopefully you've already read, is very short. So while I'm blabbering on for a second with the introduction, you could probably read the whole thing if you haven't read it yet. But uh, this story is written by one of my favorite contemporary Israeli authors. His name is Etgar Karat. In my first year of rabbinical school, I actually had the honor and privilege of meeting him. And he represents a new generation, a new wave of Israeli authors. He follows in the footsteps of Amos Oz and Abi Yehoshua. And one of, one of his best friends is actually, and I think this embodies the new wave of Israeli literature, one of his best friends is Syed Kashua, a Palestinian um, short story author. Um, and and um, they have a really interesting and deep friendship. And what they write about is not the kibbutznik of old or the warrior um, or the pioneer. They write about what Israel is like today. So it's, it's my honor to read this, uh, at times funny, at times uh, interesting, and at first glance, very simple story, the bus driver who, uh, sorry, the story about a bus driver who wanted to be God. I want to begin by just asking you, what is this story about? Can anybody give a, a very brief synopsis or summary? Yes, please. 
And if you don't mind, um, because we're all wearing masks and I can't tell exactly who all of you are, if you don't mind just saying your name first before, uh, before your comment. Do I need to? Thanks. If you, if you use the mic, actually, I was going to repeat it, but if you use the mic, uh, the people on the Zoom and on the live stream can hear us, too. It's about, uh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> it's a story about a bus driver who previously aspired to be God and has a life philosophy of staying on time and leaving people behind who are even seconds late, no matter what the excuse might be. And so, his yeah. reaction to an individual who did show up late. Thank you. A and comedy certainly ensues. Thank you, David. Um, we have this bus driver who has this very particular ideology, and we'll talk more about his ideology in just a minute. Um, and we have two other main characters in this story. Who are those characters? in addition to the bus driver who wanted to be God. Yes, please. There's Eddie. Thank you, yes. So there's this guy, Eddie, um, and I'll ask you who, what this guy, Eddie, was like in a minute. And then we have this girl, Happiness, that Eddie meets. I'm um, in Hebrew, this story is written in Hebrew and then translated to English. In Hebrew, her name is Osher. And Osher is, uh, there's a couple words for happiness in, in Hebrew. Um, there's the, the most common one is simcha, um, and which means happiness or joy. And then Osher. Osher is like a higher level of happiness. It's, it's like existential joy. Um, and that's what, and yeah, Rabbi Greenstein. Beautiful, beautiful. It's, it's the most, the highest level of contentment uh, that we have a word for. So that's her name. And um, then we have Eddie. Uh, poor Eddie. Wh what's Eddie like? Yes. Yes. Perfect, exactly. Love it, exactly. So Eddie is, uh, if, if uh, Leo Bierman were here teaching a Yiddish story, um, Eddie would be the, the prototypical Shlemiel. He is just can't seem to do anything right. He, he did seem to hold down a job at uh, the steak, or like the steak escape, steak away, steak away, thank you. Um, he held ja down a job as a cook there, but his food wasn't any good. Um, and one day, this girl, Happiness, comes into the restaurant, and he, he serves her bad food, and, and he apologizes for it. Uh, he's, he's probably you know about as awkward as you can imagine. And he apologizes profusely for how bad the food is. And you know what? She gives him his number. She's so nice, she gives him his number. Um, and they, they plan to meet. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but he is just, he's helpless. He's, ho he's hopeless. He, he has this affliction um, where he is, no matter what, no matter how hard he tries, he's 10 minutes late to everything. Um, uh, I, I try not to be Eddie. And... Um, he, he, when he's about to meet Osher, when he's about to meet happiness uh, at, at some point in the future, he sets like a zillion alarms to try to wake up. And what happens? He sleeps 10 minutes late. Um, and that's why he's late for the bus. That's why he's late for the bus. So let's get back to the bus driver a little bit. And, and David, you alluded to this. 
um, started talking about it. What exactly is the bus driver's ideology? Yes. Exactly, exactly. So he is very, in, in his head, he's bearing, being very fair-minded. He says, look, I got a bus full of 20 people, maybe 30 people. You've, if any of you have been on a bus in Israel, you know they really pack them in. Uh, so 20 people on the bus. Um, it's not fair if one person's uh, running late and delays everybody while they're getting on the bus, 30 seconds, you multiply that 30 seconds times the 30 people on the bus, that's some serious time that you're wasting. So he has it in his mind that even if he seems like not the nicest guy to the, to the poor schlub who's running after the bus uh, to try to get, to try to make it, in fact, in his mind, he is fair. He has the good of society um, at heart. What, what do you think about this? What do you think about this ideology? Yeah. Basically, people have, people have no idea as to the reason he doesn't wait for them. And at the same time, there is a tremendous evolution because the last scene, he does wait. Mm. And so the I, I want you to hold on that okay. part for a minute. I, I want to point but, out yeah, go for it. that... Um, Just don't give away the very ending quite yet. Okay, well, the aspect is that... Uh, how is our relationship with God and with each other? And this, I think, reads into this story of the bus driver, how he changes. And the reason, well, I can't go to, I can't, so I, I can't I, if you I don't want me to give the back. last line of the, the uh, Let of me the come story, back to you on that one. I will, t I will t you know, then I can't give you my so, thesis. For so, you. Uh, I want to definitely come back to you. Can you uh, remind me of your name? Avram Cohen. Avram Cohen? Yes. Avram, thank you for your very insightful comment. I promise I'll come back to you on that piece in just a minute. But what I do want to touch on, um, and it looks like she wants to take the microphone. Thank you. Um, what I do want to touch on is your point about how the bus driver appears to all of the people. So if you are the poor schlub, um, Maybe schlub is not the nicest word. If you're, you happen to be running 30 seconds late and you miss the bus, then um, and you're banging on the door, you're saying, please, please let me in, you could be on the way to a job interview. You could be doing something very important. And you might um, think that this bus driver, actually, uh, in the word that uh, the translation uses is SOB. He's, he's an SOB. That's what it says. Um, but what about, what about the other people? The other people who um, are on the bus, they probably never even notice that the bus driver is doing something with their best interests at heart. Yeah, you wanna, say, you wanna add something? Wait one second, we got a mic coming your way. They only notice in the final scene. Right. And as such, um, they are angry and they are yelling and at the same, uh, so at, at this point in time, you know, that could be us. We all yell at God for something. Yet at the same time, there is compassion in the, in the, uh, in the final wink at the end, at the end. Beautiful, beautiful. So uh, I'll take some other thoughts in a minute, but I just want to summarize what I think you said, which is that God uh, or, or the bus driver's 
ideology seems fair to the to the um, impartial observer. It seems fair. It actually seems like a very good utilitarian policy to maximize the utility, to maximize the time not being wasted of all the people on the bus. But from uh, Eddie or somebody running to get the bus, from their individual perspective, from their limited perspective, it seems to be uh, not right. It seems to be unfair. And so if we look at the bus driver the way that we look at God, does, how does that change our focus of God's actions, God's treatment of us? When something bad happens to us, do we say, you know what? I have faith in God's plan. I have faith that the, the fairness of the bus driver's plan is uh, what God, you know, is, is putting into place. And so if that happens to me, something bad happens to me, well, it's all part of God's plan, even if it seems really unfair to us. So that, that could be one way that we view um, the bus driver's ideology and our response to it. Other thoughts? Yes, please. It's, it's important, by the way, that we use the mic because I, I was home watching a, a session and you couldn't you couldn't hear anybody from from the audience that commented on things. So you have to use the mic if you're for people who are watching it on a streaming or watching on Facebook. But. Um, I, I see Eddie's philosophy as having a place. Uh, I it's uh, I see it. I see the story as a conflict, sort of between doing uh, the greatest good for the greatest number, and then when that conflicts with when you do that, it may hurt certain individuals. Uh, so his, I see his. Uh, his ideology is having a, having a place. Any institution or country, this temple has to set up certain policies for everybody. But some of those, sometimes those policies will be adverse or harmful to certain individuals. So it's a question of balance, sort of. It's a question of weighing one against the other. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm, I want to get back to that question of balance in just a moment. Uh, yes, please. Oh, uh, were you taking the mic to somebody else? Okay. You can be the arbiter. So uh, whoever, Rachel, that's my lovely wife, Rachel, whoever she takes the mic to, they can speak. You, you are the bus driver. You are the mic uh, passer who wanted to be God. You're never late. Yeah, also, um, we, we can hear you through your mask if you have the mic, so please please stay masked. And I know I'm being hypocritical uh, of that, but I'm trying to stay a little farther away. I, I just want to say, I'm thinking about Eddie's perception of this. Eddie, in this story, is taking full responsibility for not getting there on time. He has got expectations that the driver or the God, whichever you want to call him, is... Eddie the schlep, the, yeah, anyway, mm -hmm. he, he strives and he's miserable because he, he really can't help it, but he doesn't expect the driver to do it. He doesn't even think badly of him. He has no expectations different from the driver. I thought that was kind of fascinating. He doesn't even try to get there quicker when he knows he won't make it because he knows the driver won't, won't do it. And he, he it doesn't say anything about him feeling angry at the driver. That, that's a really good point. So you're drawing a, a distinction, and if we extrapolate this to issues of theology, that if something bad happens to us and we think we're, we're being a good person, we're doing all the meets vote, um, as, as Israelites in the Bible would say, if, if we do all the mitzvot, if we do all the mitzvahs, God will take care of us. God will protect us. So then how do we reconcile if we're being a good person, we're doing all these great things, and then something bad happens to us? We say, is God, um, how is that fair, God? We, we were doing everything right, and yet something bad happened. You, you let something bad happen to us. 
you're very right to point out that that is not exactly what's happening in the story. Eddie has every expectation that if he's late, he's going to be left behind. So the bus driver, so he's not angry at the rule that, uh, that the bus driver came up with. Yeah, please. So, um, I might have to, okay, sorry. Um, so if you look at it, um, at least for the people who are on the bus, um, as humans, we are inherently creatures of habit. So they get on the bus every day, they expect it to leave at the same time every day, all that stuff. However, the one time that it doesn't happen, or the one time that something in our lives is thrown out of place, we don't know how to react. We might get angry, we might start yelling, and it can be seen as they have no idea why. They're not even trying to question it. They're just throwing their fists in the air and yelling, and rather than trying to figure out why it's happening. So th that is a good reason why we like to think about God as having a very ordered universe. We, wanna, we like to think that the world operates by these certain rules, and that's why um, when Eddie, uh, sorry, when the bus driver drives away and leaves people behind, it seems fair because that's just the rules of the road. Yeah, go ahead. The bus driver is supposed to be symbolic of God, apparently. And I don't want a God that operates like this. All people have imperfections and Running late is an imperfection. I want a God that forgives small imperfections because we all have them. Beautiful. Thank you. And, and what a message for Yom Kippur, right? Um, that we all make these mistakes. Some of us make little mistakes like running late. Some of us make big mistakes. And we ask that today, um, especially but every day, that God forgives and God looks past those small imperfections um, to who we hope to be inside. But so that's, uh, at the beginning of the story, the bus driver is, uh, does embody this ideology, does enforce this ideology of being very strict. But that's not the ideology when he was a kid and wanted to be God that he wanted to have, right? What is the ideology um, that he aspired to have. If he said, someday, if I grow up and I get to be God, how did he want to behave? Please. Uh, yeah, my name is Judy. Um, you use the word utilitarian, and I think that that's the way the bus driver, that's the way the bus driver was. But that reminds me of a government. That's what a government does, a democratic government. They try to do the best good for the most people. I read an article um, somewhere that just reminded me of this when it was talking about Afghanistan. We could left you, Afghanistan. Could you hold the mic a little closer? Oh, I'm sorry. We left Afghanistan um, because it was the best thing to do for the most people. And then people were left behind. And to me, it was like um, the utilitarian was the bus driver, and he changed himself into God when he decided at the end that he was going to take care and give mercy, and he used the word mercy, to somebody. So that changed him from a bus driver to God. And at the end, he just gives a little wink to the guy saying, yeah, I'm God now. Mm, interesting. Okay, so you're saying that actually, in fact, he wanted to grow up to be God. He ended up being a bus driver, which I love. I'm just going to read this line. Um, yeah, exactly. He says um, that when Eddie, Eddie caught up with the bus and he, he was so tired, I'm not sure he had any particular health problems. He was just out of shape. Uh, and it says he, he smoked a pack of Lucky Strike, so also a smoker. So sprinting after the bus left him winded. And um, he fell, Eddie fell to his, his knees with moist eyes, panting and wheezing. And this reminded the driver of something, something from out of the past, from a time even before he wanted to become a bus driver, when he still wanted to become God. It was kind of a sad memory, because the driver didn't become God in the end. But it was a happy one, too, because he became a bus driver, which was his second choice. So Edgar Carrot is also funny. Um, and suddenly the driver remembered how he'd once promised himself 
that if he became God in the end, he'd be merciful and kind and would listen to all his creatures. So when he saw Eddie from way up in his driver's seat, kneeling on the asphalt, he simply couldn't go through with it in spite of his ideology. In spite of his ideology, couldn't go through with it. So what, what is, uh, I'll come to you in one second, but what I love that you pointed out was that maybe, in fact, in the end, he did become God. Maybe by changing his ideology from being very fair, from being um, totally uh, arithmetic, that he somehow, by embracing this compassion, he somehow became God. That's a, I, that's a really nice take. Please. Um, I'm always reminded that when it comes to the other, we want justice. But when it comes to ourselves, we want mercy or compassion. As such, the standard is that when, when, you're, when you stand before God, you are hoping for compassion and mercy. But when we judge others, we want, every, we want, we're, we want justice. And the difference here is I don't think he becomes God. I think it is a, a basically what, what we are supposed to become. We are supposed to become like the bus driver. I don't think we can become God, but we can become compassionate. And the lesson here is, to me, is not to want justice, but to see the individual as opposed to just seeing the group. Very nice. Very nice. So um, what you are saying is that we, we seem to want this balance of justice and of compassion. And I wish that, I wish that uh, Mr. Bierman, that Leo Bierman were here to talk about this, because when we think about a judge, you're right. When, when you stand before a judge um, and, and somebody else is being, not, not when you stand uh, before a judge, let's say that you're a victim, right? And uh, the accused is standing before the judge, y you want justice, right? You, you, want, you want the, victim, the uh, perpetrator to get what he or she or they deserve. And yet, when it's you standing before the judge, you want compassion, of course. So I wish that as the, the great legal mind that Mr. Beerman was, that he could weigh in on how uh, the judges in, in a system of, of justice, in a court of law, how do they balance this idea of justice and compassion? But the Kabbalists, the, the Jewish mystics, they say that, in fact, the world is a perfect balance of rachamim, of compassion, of, of, of chesed, of loving kindness, and deen. That at all times in the world, there's a total balance. The, if if uh, there became uh, an imbalance, the world would, would cease to exist. If there was too much deen, then um, everything would fall apart. If there's too much compassion, um, everything would fall apart. What's really interesting is that in the Talmud, in Brachot 7a, when the rabbis um, of old, the rabbis of yore, our sages, were talking about what uh, the words of their prayers should be. Uh, one rabbi was saying, I, I, I think it's important to pray for this. And another rabbi was saying, I think it's important to pray for this. And then one of them said, you know what? I wonder what God prays when, when God prays. And the rabbi said that God prays that God's rachamim, God's compassion, will outweigh God's deen, God's justice. So I think what all of you are saying is that, in a way, the driver maybe doesn't become God, but becomes more God-like which is what we all are stri should hopefully strive to do, is to be more like God. There's a, a Latin term, imitatio dei, that that is what religious practice is. It's striving to be like God. Um, and so in, by becoming more compassionate, by embracing rachamim, the driver is encouraging what all of us should, should work on on Yom Kippur. Beautiful. Yes, please. Sure. Uh, Let's take Jonathan first, and then... Oh, so you're in. Yeah, and then Jonathan. 
please. So um, my name is Erin, and what you just said is exactly what I was thinking, the idea of B'tsem Elohim, that I was on the same page as Russell, but the, the utilitarian way of thinking was not how I would want God to be, but that, and also that the bus driver does not become God, but that the bus driver becomes God-like. And it was an idea that then I was thinking that spreads to everyone involved in the story. If we're talking about the perspectives of everyone involved, the people on the bus, Eddie running up to the bus, everyone is in their own world. Everyone is not paying attention to their community. So what is it that is making it so the people on the bus don't notice that someone is running behind and is being left behind? They're looking at their phones, are they reading a book, are they just looking out the window and not paying attention and drifting off? And that the action of the bus driver to stop and show compassion and let Eddie on the bus is shocking everyone into this moment of community to realize that they can reach out. Well, I, I'm blown away by that interpretation. I did not read that at all. And, and I think you have really hit on something that we see actions happen in the world. We see events happen in the world. And we think to ourselves, you know, what can we do? It's sad that that's happening to that other person. It's sad that poor Eddie was getting left on the side of the road, but what can I really do? I'm just one person. Or Afghanistan is halfway across the world. What can I do? Or name any one thing that, that we look at and, and we don't stand up. And what you're saying is, in fact, it's not just about what the bus driver plans. It's not just about what the bus driver or God ordains but in fact that we can change history, we can change and influence what happens in the world through our actions. If all of the people on the bus had stood up and said, you know what, Mr. Bus Driver, please, uh, there's a guy there, please stop for Eddie, maybe he would have. So beautiful idea, thank you. This is Jonathan uh, Frisch. My question is, why Eddie? It seems like there were other people who the bus driver said no, he, he was rigid in his thoughts. But with Eddie, he stopped, and that's what kept going through my mind. Why did he choose Eddie? I don't have an answer. Great question. I want to open it up. What do you all think? Thank you to Rachel. Well, I, 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 uh, I, I agree that Eddie's actions in the, in the final part of the story showed compassion. But it occurred to me when I was reading this or afterwards, what if there were somebody on the bus who was going to visit somebody at the hospital and the hospital had visiting hours and Eddie, and there were 10 people strewn, strewn out along the way who needed to get on the bus and the bus driver stopped for each one of them and it resulted in the, uh, the person missing the visiting hour, not going to see a person who was sick or who was dying or something like that so you know to play to play the devil's advocate it's a question it seems like it's a practical question you, you rules are made and we all know that we're tempted at times to to break those rules in support of compassion because because we you know somebody didn't didn't follow the rules. It may not have been their fault. But um, it just, like I said, it just seems to me to be a question of where you, where you draw the line, where you, you know, what the balance is. And also, some people who violate the rules, they complain about the institution and they say, this is not fair, and so on. But they were at fault. They didn't do what they were supposed to do, you know? Maybe some of these people along the way realize, hey, if, I, if I'm going to catch this bus, I've got to be there on time, you know? I've got to. Uh, it's my responsibility, too. So that's, yeah. that's another side. Of it. Yeah, thank you. I, I think you bring up uh, a really nice point that what are challenges to compassion, to the idea that, that God should be compassionate, that we should make exceptions 
to the rule when everybody else knew the rules. Um, and so th these two systems of morality are in tension with one another, right? Of course we want Dean. Of course we want justice. Of course we want things to go by the rules. If not, how could we have society? But if everything only operates according to the rules, then you miss the, the individual, as you mentioned earlier. So great, great point, please. Let's think about this just for a moment. Um, where we talk about flipping it, just a second, like um, Eddie, Eddie had a condition, and this was brought out multiple times. Now this condition was an infliction that he had no control over. This was mentioned multiple times. So let's think about the parallels in today's world that that could be. So we have to understand there's gotta be compassion and empathy for one another, as opposed to a strict rule. A rule is, yes, it's there, but there's also exceptions to the rule, or understanding that there are things going on in society that, that are out of other people's control. And so maybe this is a situation where the bus driver was able to become somewhat benevolent and saw compassion and saw an opportunity to, to do some good for an individual and a situation that I think there are tremendous parallels in today's society that are, un, that are out of individual's control. And so that's, that's an exception to, you know, hey, you broke the rule. There are other things. Yeah, very nice. And you remind me of, um, of a story that I remember Rabbi Greenstein telling me when I was a very little kid. Um, and it's the starfish story, which you, you may know. It's, uh, it's a well-known story um, about, and I, I'm not going to retell the whole story right the second because I want to hear your thoughts. But the idea is that um, you, while we might not be able to change the entire world, we can make a difference. We can save this starfish or this starfish or this one. We can save um, the, the ones that are right in front of us to save. We can make a difference. Um, and it'll mean the world to those who we can save, who we can help. And so, to your point, perhaps the bus driver had this rule that served him for a really long time, but when he looked into the eyes of one person and saw how much it would mean to him, perhaps he just let the, the, the dean, the, the strictness, fall by the wayside. Please. I have kind of a... I have kind of a different idea with this. I, um, the word that keeps popping in my head is grace. Uh, grace is mercy extended even when it's not justified. Uh, at this time, it seems to me that the bus driver extended that grace even though it wasn't warranted, it wasn't justified in, within the context of the rules, but that grace was extended at that moment to affect that person and thus it spreads out kind of like the love of God that spreads out to us through his grace because we come here today to atone for what our actions of the year past do we deserve that grace no but a loving and just God forgives and extends that grace to us even though it's not we did nothing to earn it. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, let's, Mike, uh, Rabbi well, Greenstein, well, I, please. I, I, I have not read the story in Hebrew, as you probably have, Rabbi. Um, it would be cool if the bus driver's name was Hanan, because the word that we often hear in American non-Jewish circles, it comes from Hebrew, chen, which is love that's extended without merit, right? And on Passover, we didn't do anything. God just freed us from Egypt. But on Yom Kippur, it does require, if I wronged you, to ask forgiveness. And yet, you're right, we experience unmerited grace or love in places we'd never expect it. So he probably wasn't expecting the bus driver to stop, but it happened. I, I just was wondering, is the bus driver, is his name Hanan or? 
It, it would be a great touch I, I'm if sorry. it was. I the bus driver. The Hebrew. It's a very Jewish point. It's, it is, um, and it, I'll just dr draw an uh, interesting um, Hebrew lesson. The bus driver doesn't have a name. It's just Nahag, the, the driver, Nahag. But interestingly, the, the root, Nun, He, Gimel, Nahag in Hebrew means to behave, means to control oneself. In the, in the Hit Pael, the reflexive tense, Lehit um, Naheg means to control oneself or to behave. Like in class, you tell the kids, uh, behave. So in a way, we're asking, does the way that the driver treats Eddie, the way that God treats us, does it depend on our behavior? Do we get what we deserve based on how we behave? Or, which I think is the, is, uh, one of the lessons of Yom Kippur, not necessarily that we get what we deserve based on how we behave, but that we should do our best to behave in a moral way because thinking about it in Judaism, it's not just faith that's important, it's action that's important. So the way that we noheg, the way that we behave, um, perhaps influences how God treats us. Or perhaps, and you take the other hand, the other side of the story, God is just operating on um, a system of, of inscrutable, a fairness that's inscrutable from our point of view. Maybe it's because of how we behave, maybe not. Yeah, we'll take a, a couple more comments, please. One of the morals of this for me, though, was that the bus driver won. He didn't become God, but he became closer to being God. And none of us becomes God, but isn't the real purpose is how close we can become to being God. And Beautiful. I think he won the game. Beautiful. So there's a, I wanna do a little character analysis really quickly of, of our three characters. We have Osher, we have Happiness, who at first glance seems to be super nice, right? She gives uh, Eddie her number, she says she'll meet instead of embarrassing him or being mean to him when the food is bad. Um, so she, happiness seems like the nicest thing that we could possibly get. And Eddie is pursuing happiness, right? And, and that's a whole thread of the story that we won't get to. Um, but, but happiness seems super nice right off the bat. Eddie, I don't know, not nice, not not nice, just kind of meh, just kind of a bump on the log. Um, and then we have the driver who seems like an SOB, but, but you are saying, in fact, through his action, through how he behaves, he can become more godlike. Beautiful, yeah. So kind of a Jonathan's question of why Eddie, and I wonder if that happens a lot in life. We don't know when God is or isn't like directly offering that olive branch, so to speak. And so it's our actions or our previous experiences that sort of give us more insight to that and so maybe I, I see the passengers on the bus as another character as well because they play a role in this um, communitively and individually in their reaction and their response at the one point they it says in the story they, they beg the driver to stop and the driver keeps going and other times they get angry when he stops but he, at the end he stops so everybody has my whole point is maybe what's happening here is it makes me think of the story of the guy who ultimately drowns because he doesn't get on the boat or he ultimately drowns because he doesn't go up the up to the helicopter that's trying to rescue him and he gets to heaven and God, he says to God, well, why did you let me drown? He says, I sent a boat, I sent a helicopter. So it's the same kind of thing. God puts Eddie on, to drive a bus as a tool for, not Eddie, I'm sorry, God puts the bus driver in the bus as a tool for Eddie ultimately, but Eddie's got to be in a place where he can receive that tool and get on that bus and find his happiness. Very nice, very nice. Um, that God, maybe God doesn't directly influence events. We don't see God as a watchmaker controlling everything perhaps, but God might give us the tools to, to help ourselves. Yeah, please. Uh, just on the thought about why Eddie, there's a uh, picture that is painted where Eddie is on the ground kneeling and he's looking up at God, the bus driver, who is on a throne. And it's almost as if, to me, he's praying, asking for some help. And God sees that. 
Very nice. It, just like um, the image from the Psalms that Happy sang earlier, Min HaMetzar Karati Yafram, the, the uh, narrow place, like Mitzrayim, um, Egypt is a narrow place. From the, the uh, most narrow place, I call out to God, and God answered me from uh, a mirchav, from a wide open space. So there is an idea that even if God doesn't necessarily listen to, uh, after the destruction of the temple, it says the gates, of, the Talmud says the gates of prayer were closed. God no longer heard our prayer, but God still hears our cries. And so when we call out to God from our lowest place, perhaps that is what made God finally listen. Beautiful. Yeah, we'll take uh, two more comments. Two more comments. Going off that last point, I'm reminded of the prayer from this morning, who by fire, who by stone. Our destiny might be set. Eddie might miss the bus. But through pr prayer, Ushashuva, Tefillah, Sadaka, it can be changed. And you know, he, he wasn't perfect, but he made an effort. He set the alarm clocks. He ran. He got down on his knees. And ultimately, God opened the gates and let him in. Beautiful. Beautiful, Zach. Um, the idea that our destiny might be preordained, um, we, we, which isn't really a Jewish idea, but that God may... Uh, write us in the book of life, or may not. But at the end of the Unatana Tokef, the, the prayer, who by fire, who by water, we say, uh, utshuva, utfila, utsadaka, ut prayer, repentance, and um, sadaka and charity. They don't reverse the decree, but they ma'avirin et roa hagazera. They lessen the harshness of the decree. And so maybe by taking all those actions, he somehow changed himself, even if God 